Felix here, a little delayed. Um, we were on the Alibaba live earnings calls and they took like two hours, but it was an interesting one. And I appreciate 400 of you or, or, or more who were watching that live. So what have we got in store in the real market outside of the Alibaba world? Well, pretty much last chance to sign up for the webinar happening this weekend. If you want to earn consistent, low risk income with options trading, or you're just curious about options, or you are knowing a lot about options, but you want to learn more, uh, come and join me for the free webinar, felixfriends.org slash webinar. And as always, this is not financial advice. This is just the ramblings of this person here who's just done a two hour Alibaba uh, call. So what have we got out? We've got tons out. We're going to talk about oil. Absolutely. That's the header here. Uh, we're going to talk about the jobless numbers that are just out. We're going to talk about Palantir. We're going to talk about Neo. We're going to talk about everything that's going on here, um, pre-market and aftermarket. Uh, CH, I am a, a tenacious live streamer today. Yes, it's, it's really uh, happening in December. Looks like it's going to be a fairly intense live streaming marathon. Um, if, if you didn't join the Barber earnings, uh, like Apple here asking, uh, they were not great. They were not bad either. It was sort of what I expected. I expected them to disappoint somewhat. I think everybody did. Uh, free cash flow drop is fairly significant, 45% down. Um, and I think we need a bit more stronger management guidance on the future of this business. But personally, I am still pretty bullish on this. Exxon, you've registered for the webinar. Well done, you. And I look forward to seeing you on there. So let me show you Briefly here, the pre-market, we still have 14 minutes pre-market. NVIDIA absolutely flying at 9.5%. We're going to look at that in a second. Tesla back up to 1,111. It's like a single stay ticker. 2% up. Uh, rides up. Sofires up. Uh, a lot of the market actually up. Plug, QQQ overall is up about half a percent. PayPal continuing it's sort of bobbing around $207. Palantir up ever so slightly to $22.50. And the big loser today, Baba, at 8% down to $148. Still nice and safe above my $130 uh, short put. So lose it down 4%. Uh, I saw GDPI is just off 1% here. This is pre-market. It's all a bit early. So it seems the market is getting a little happier here. Uh, and there are several reasons for that. One is, I don't know if you saw this, this is a big story here on the Asian Reuters. Uh, the US has basically asked not just its allies, but also everybody else, China, Japan, and everybody else, uh, to release emergency oil supplies. So it Apparently, Biden had asked people like China, India, Japan to consider releasing crude stockpiles to basically squash OPEC. Um, the U.S. has a massive st uh, store of um, crude oils, uh, which were set up after the sort of 1917 OPEC uh, nonsense. And we look at the, the oil futures here. They are down a little bit. I think 5% last time I checked. We'll put that up here again. Oil, oil, oil. Where is crude? Uh, here we go. Crude, and it's actually up again a little. Uh, crude oil Brent here is, but it's still, if you can see that chart down a bit, it's at 80. It was at 85 uh, only a few days ago. So why is anybody concerned about this? Because it's massively inflationary, right? Uh, and if Biden does release the oil uh, stockpiles, then that could have a bit of an impact. But if everybody did it at the same time, all the major countries, it would have a very, very big impact. So the US presently has uh, 600 million barrels of crude stockpiled, which is a lot less than in previous years. Um, it, they've been, it seems sort of like they've been releasing for some time here. Uh, so it's having a bit of an impact. The question is really whether people will catch on to it and whether it's actually going to help ease inflation. But you know what it also means? It also means the administration is starting to freak out a little bit about inflation. And they're kind of thinking, this could not be good. Uh, we've um, we've uh, printed 30% more US dollars in the last year than they've ever been. And that might just cause a little bit of inflation. So, you know, that's kind of the thing. And Daniel, you're on your question there, I think that again, this ties in. Will Jay Powell get replaced? Well, 
he could be the fall guy, right? If you are a, a politician, you always look for someone else to be the fall guy so you can point your finger at. So we could we could get rid of Jay Powell and then blame him for the inflation and the whole transitory mess uh, while Biden comes out smelling of roses with his EV program, infrastructure program, and releasing oil worldwide. I, I think that's sort of the, the political story behind, behind this. Uh, Chris, you you were listening to the uh, whole Barber call without uh, being invested because you want to get a feel for the China market. That's a smart one, actually, because Alibaba has like 44% of all online retail in China. So yeah, it, it definitely is a very good indicator to what's going on over there. And definitely uh, GDP growth single digit slowdown was definitely mentioned quite a bit. Um there is a very nice story out for you parliamentarians out there on Investor Place uh, that based on the free cash flow, which is very nice and healthy, they think uh, Palantir is worth an extra 68% because of the consistent uh, free cash flow that's going to keep growing, a 30% margin of revenue. So um, they count this forward uh, to 2023, still at 30%. And that's how they come up with a target market value of 76 billion. Is that, hang on, what did they come up with? So they think it's worth $38 per stock, which would be very nice. I'd be very, very happy with that. Uh, so I closed out of some options trades at a loss today on Palantir, which I'll, of course, share with you guys on the Discord. Uh, I share the, the, the gains and the losses. And with options, you know, you're not aiming for 100% gains. You are actually aiming for you know, 70, 80 percent gains uh, and some just go against you. Um, shorting Rivian today, says David. Well, yes, the market is hitting Rivian over there. Is it? Yeah. Well, down four percent to 140. That's still 126 billion valuation. And Lucid also down 4.8 percent still an 86 billion valuation. So is the market uh, finding some sense? And, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, the GGP ice back, uh, which is Polestar, is still worth less than 30 billion, right? So, you know, the world's a funny place and they actually have 1.6 billion in revenue, but that's just my my personal take on that. Um, I, did I say that this is only for financial advice? If not, it is. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the key news here of what's going on. Um, so what have we got? Retail giants, Target and Walmart have got great earnings. They're beating earnings despite inflation, despite supply chain issues. It just goes to show if you do it well, if you run a decent business, you can actually do well. Uh, and they've basically been chartering their own shipping, their own boats, Boats, you wouldn't call them boats, vessels, right? Uh, so they've been really going out there. They both obviously have pretty deep pockets, so they can uh, do a good job there. They're apparently well stacked, stocked rather uh, for for the Christmas business. Um, right. Morgan Stanley, I seems some reports here, are still saying 2022 will be the year for the stock picker. So, you know, are you are you a stock picker? Are you you know what 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 to to stock pick? Now, I'll put out a list tomorrow of the Morgan Stanley top 27 stocks. I'll turn that into a benchmark and share it with you. We've got Alibaba JD earnings today. I think JD doing rather better than Alibaba, at least the reception of it. Um, Li Lu, who some of you might know, is sort of the Chinese. Warren Buffett, guess what he's bought? Berkshire Hathaway shares. <laughs> so sometimes uh, no point in, in, in copying something, just buy it and, and, and save yourself a lot of work. So he's bought uh, $245 million in Berkshire Hathaway, which is kind of funny, really. So if you invest in this Himalaya fund, which is a US-based fund, uh, you're basically paying Li Lu to invest in Berkshire Hathaway. That's kind of ironic, isn't it? Um, the Los Angeles Staples Center will be renamed Crypto.com Arena. That's not a great name, is it? Well, oh well. $700 million they're spending on that. So there's some money to be made in crypto, that's for sure. Crypto.com, um, insane. $700 million to name a stadium. 
uh, well, I, I, I hope it works out for them. So that's uh, one of the big items here. Uh, we also have a bit of a summary of what's going on here. So yeah, job numbers. I wanted to show you job numbers. I'm still slightly ruffled from the Alibaba two hours. So jobless claims. We were expecting 276,000 and we got 272,000. Uh, that's the jobless claims, the four-week average. So joblessness, again, lower than expected. On the initial jobless claims, so these are, the, you know, the, they are slightly higher, but it's only 5,000, so I wouldn't read too much into that. Um, and the Fed manufacturing index is, is almost double what people expected it to be. That's rather baffling, isn't it? Um, economists overall are not very good at predicting data. I think that's the one thing we're really learning here. Uh, Desmond, yes, you are. You very good story you're putting out here, Desmond. I did also read that uh, Apple uh, is kind of trying to ride ahead of the pressure by U.S. governments to kind of make their systems less, you know, insular. So they're going to allow uh, third-party repair shops and people to buy uh, genuine Apple repair kits. Uh, which is is a big pain point, I think, for people who have Apple. You always have to go to the Apple store. So yes, um, uh, yeah. He is asking if you go back in time, would you still buy Neo or maybe choose a, a, another company? Uh, I think uh, Exxon says it quite quite nicely here. If you go back in time, you always buy the ones with the, the highest you know return on capital employed, the highest free cash flow, the highest growth rates, and that is what more than ninety percent of my portfolio is. I know you've been watching for some time here, so I'm sure you've seen my core portfolio, which is also on the Patreon on the Discord. That's where the bulk of my money is. I then cherry pick some growth stocks, which is harder to do, and you will have a higher failure rate. Uh, and those, I kind of think you have to hold for 10 years. Uh, that's probably a, a decent time frame just to give them a chance to do something right. But doesn't mean you should forget about them. You have to see whether they, they are executing. At the moment, very hard to say for some companies like Neo, are they executing or are they not? Uh, how is the chip shortage affecting them? Why is Tesla doing it better and that sort of thing? So, you know, there are some, some questions to be asked there for sure. Uh, Michael says, economists and weather forecasters are the only people that can keep their jobs and be incorrect over 50% of the time. Totally agree with you on there, Michael. And I am an economist, so I'm very happy about that. Um, Desmond said, if I go back in time, I'd buy Microsoft when they were fundraising. Yeah, of course. I mean, you, you wouldn't, right? Uh, and, and when everybody was whinging about them in the 90s, you would have loaded up the boat uh, and you'd be sitting on a boat right now and you would have called it a bill or something. So precisely. you know. The market overall is right here, right now. It's actually looking pretty good. Nasdaq's up half a percent, S&P up half of that. And can you see that difference? That's the difference between inflation impacting growth stocks. So because inflation fears a little bit down because oil is down 5% today, Nasdaq stocks go up twice as much as S&P stocks because inflation is about twice as important for Nasdaq stocks as it is for S&P stocks. You see, there we go. A bit of an economic a lesson thrown in here. Um, can we have a look at the Palantir chart? Absolutely. We could definitely do that. Uh, I've got GIG open here. I did a, a really interesting video, I thought, interview on that yesterday. Was it yesterday, maybe the day before. Check it out if you want to know more about the uh, the Bear, uh, Big Bear AI um, Palantir partnership, which is much more than a usual partnership. It's kind of a joint venture type partnership because they're kind of competitors, but they're choosing to work together, which is really an interesting take. So... Well, what have we got? Well, you can see all of my little charts and drawings here. When you drop below that triangle, when you break out of it below the green line, you get a sell-off signal. That's exactly what happened at earnings. Uh, and now we are kind of hobbling sideways. What's our support here? Well, it's around about where we are right now. It's sort of 22, 2240, 2250, something like that. Uh, Fibonacci has it at 22.12, which is, happens to be the low, of course, Fibonacci, the all-knowing indicator here. So this is kind of our support line, 22.12 and, and 22.35. We fall below 22.12, 22, 
we are basically looking back at the 20s. Uh, if we hold this level for a little bit, I think we have a chance to creep creep our way up. It was too late, though, however, for my options trade expiring today. So uh, that hurt a little. But that's why when you do options trades, you have to make them small because there will be some losers. Even if you do a 70% probability trade, three out of 10 of those could lose. And in theory, that could be three in a row, right? So always do it with small amounts so that your capital is not killed off by it. So the market's open. I'm going to look at the chart in just a second here. Uh, William says the FTC is going to uh, investigate oil price manipulation. Okay, so this is basically Biden throwing everything he's got at oil and trying to blame oil in all its forms, whether it's OPEC, Saudis, uh, or Russians, or, or the big oil uh, people uh, for inflation. I think that's the attempt here to change that narrow narrative from, you know, it's possibly printing 30% more US dollars in a year, might have something to do with inflation, uh, or, um, you know, can we blame some foreigners for it? I think blaming foreigners is generally preferable if you're a politician. So I think that's the way they're going to go there. Um, William Lee's with us. Oh, yes, William Lee's with us. Brilliant. We also had Jack Ma on the Alibaba earnings call. So, uh, you know, uh, absolutely marvelous. Now, Desmond is actually, I agree with Biden on this one, and I don't, don't, don't very often agree with Biden on many things, but the shipping industry is a very tight knit run club. Uh, I have some businesses also where we ship things around the world. And it's it's it is a scandal, and I think there will be monopoly fines in five to ten years. That's how long regulators take. Uh, basically, all the big vessel owners group together in alliances. Uh, they have cut. Then say there are three of them. They cut two of the three routes that were sailing every week, and then they only have one together, which they of course fill. They they rate inflate the rates and and then pretend that there isn't enough supply. I look out of my window in Hong Kong, I can see about a hundred parked vessels in the dark at night, container ships. You're just sitting there because it's free or near free. So that's what's happening. So yes, I do actually think that is a bit of a scandal here. So for once, Biden seems to be right on something here. Uh, yeah, here wants the webinar link. Can you see it on the screen? It's felixfriends.org slash webinar. I'll type it for you too. And then you can click on it. There we go. It's in the in the window here, uh, so you can you can just simply click on that in in, in the live chat. Uh, come and join me for that. It's going to be absolutely marvelous. It's going to be two parts as well. So we're gonna we're gonna go deep. We're gonna go really deep, uh, and it is it is all free. So um, do join us for that. So what were we talking about? Neo. Have you seen this? If you are a a a, a neo warrior then I think you're going to enjoy this. This is also, so I'm just trying to move this banner a bit lower here. There we go. This was uh, shared on our Discord earlier. So thank you for whoever shared that. Let me just pull that up here too. Not on this Discord already, uh, come and join the Patreon. Um, it's always good fun. So yeah, lots of talk here about a German luxury car is going to become the next Nokia. Love to know the views of any other other fellow Germans out here. You see that? That's the Qingdao uh, police. And they've bought, well, at least eight Neos. Here they are looking very snazzy. Uh, so some of people were asking a few weeks ago, you know, who actually bought these when we saw these. So I think that's a good thing. That's a nice government support here from Qingdao and hopefully a sign of things to come. Chinese government departments buying Chinese-made premium vehicles. So um, there we go. Uh, Felix, you are completely right. Thank you very much. Container ships do pay a lot of demurrage. It is, however, that's what I really was trying to say, much cheaper to park your boat out in the South China Sea, what I can see, rather than doing it in Hong Kong port. And that's why they do it. So there are these like kind of it's sort of allocated spots where you can linger and they've been lingering there for some time. And of course, that costs money still to run uh, and it costs uh, demurrage and um, they're going to try and recoup that. But I still think that there is a artificially created shortage of vessels out there because there are a lot lying right here. 
Uh, CHS today is a look away day for my portfolio. Often that's a, that's a good thing. Um, okay, Evergrande, what's happening there? Well, Evergrande have sold more of their business. I think they raised $258 million or something like that yesterday. Uh, hang on, we go. They sold. Here we go. Um, they so raised $273 million. Uh, they sold Hang Tang, which is sort of a streaming company, uh, and that's giving them some nice cash. S&P Global Rating says uh, a default is still highly likely for the world's most indebted developer, despite recent coupon payments. And they basically have to pay about three and a half billion by next March, April. So yeah, I, I also think essentially they will default, but they won't do it in an unorganized way. I think they're going to keep paying coupons until they come to a settlement with bondholders, and then they're going to pay back a fraction of debt. How are they going to raise that money? Well, there'll be some sort of backstop. Maybe they can get some loans from, you know, Chinese government owned or influenced banks who lend them some money to pay off the bondholders. And that way they can basically get that haircut that you would normally get in an insolvency and end up with only 30% of the debt, at which point the whole business becomes viable again, actually. So I, I kind of think that's what's going to happen there. I, I don't think we're going to get a, um, a disorganized default. I don't think anybody wants that. And I don't think regulators want that either. So Shall we have a look at the market as it's open in all its uh, glory or hideousness, depending on what you're looking at? NVIDIA up 9%. So we're going to have to pull up uh, NVDA here. So let's do it on this chart. Let's have a look at their numbers. Um, absolutely flying after earnings. So let's have a look. Earnings, earnings, earnings. Uh, okay, this is a roundup. We wanted the actual earn. Okay, here we go. So earnings were up 5.6% and revenue up 4% above um, expectations. So they continue to do a fantastic job there. Uh, and I mean, this this rally just keeps keeps going, right? It just keeps, keeps, keeps rallying more and more. So Fernando says, uh, smash the like button. Thank you very much. I appreciate that you're here. Also, thank you very much for uh, all the likes and all the subscribes. Can't believe that we are over 28,000. We're sort of sailing towards 30, which seems kind of unreal. Given that this time last year, I didn't have a, have a YouTube channel. There was no community. There weren't um, hundreds and hundreds of people on the Patreon. And uh, it, it is marvelous. So a huge thank you to you. I really uh, in, enjoy this um, on green days and red days, but it, it, it's always good fun. And it's also allowing me to spend more time looking at my investments and things, which is helpful. So Alibaba down 9.6% here. Insane. Uh, outdoing Rivian for loser of the day, at least this early in the morning. Lucid down 7 uh, PDD is also down 4%. I suppose they get impacted by everything that Baba just said about, you know, slowing consumer spending and, and, and that sort of thing. Neo down 2%. That might just be the Chinese sentiment again there. Can't really see much logic for it. Palantir down 1.3%. Why, oh, why? We ask uh, PayPal down 1%. So crikey, the market's really going for it now, isn't it? Uh, it's it's sort of turning a little bit dark. Twitter down as well still. Tesla, however, is miraculously up $1,109. As is GameStop which is never a good sign, really. And what's DraftKings doing? They're up 1.4%. But NVIDIA really is the golden golden star today here. Uh, and a bit of money flowing back into banks and sort of safety havens. But yeah, Baba now down 10%. That's really quite something, 145. I'm glad my short puts are at 130 and not at 140. Otherwise, I'd be uh, getting feeling a little jittery right now. Uh, Desmond, uh, thank you for your infinite wisdom here. Yes, you're absolutely right. Huarong was the company before Evergrande, a bit smaller. They basically got restructured. City bought $6 billion. And I think we're going to, that's kind of what we are seeing, right? People are suddenly buying Evergrande assets and therefore pumping cash into the business. And I think that'll continue. So um, absolutely right. Same playbook for Evergrande. I, I agree with you there. And you know what? If you can 
if you can buy back Evergrande's debt at say 30 cents on the dollar, the whole business is is actually solves all of its problems, right? It's actually the the perfect outcome for them. Uh, Weejo's up says uh, Michael. Actually, I don't have that on here yet, do I? Is it still V O O S? Mm -hmm. Have they changed ticker? Weejo. Why not? It's sorry, it's Vo Vozo, isn't it? It's not V O O S. V O S O. Yeah, here we go. Okay, let's add that to our watch list. About to do the merger, 18% uh, app, crikey. So this is what happens when mergers actually come to fruition and, and, and Weijo is, is going to become Weijo. Uh, Frank Sinatra is, is singing. Uh, thank you very much. What's your projection for Barber recovery to 250? Look, I mean... My intrinsic value on Baba, you, you, if you want to download it, here it is, uh, felixfriends.org slash Alibaba. I, I struggle to get it below 300. I, I, I just do. Uh, I find it difficult with the numbers. Even with the the, the, the lower guidance from today, uh, I've already put that in that, in, there, in that model. So if you go to felixfriends.org slash Alibaba, you can get your hands on that for free. Um, it's also on the Patreon, of course. If you're already on there, you can download that. So I think the real problem is timeline. We just don't know because it's been a year of, of misery and it's hard to get out of that you know to turn momentum around i don't think today's call did anything for that uh, they have an opportunity december 16th and 17th they're holding an investor day to do something again i don't think that in itself will give us the boost that we need you need lots of incremental bits of good news you need management getting out a new story, a new message. And that needs to be done very, very aggressively and, and over a time period. So I, I'm, I don't have huge hopes for the next 12 months on Alibaba. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not a great company that I'm not bullish on the fundamentals. So I think I'll probably stick to my, my uh, shorting puts uh, strategy, which is so far uh, giving me quite nice results. So uh, if you want to know how, how that works, join the webinar, felixfriends.org slash webinar. Uh, and uh, is Palantir seeing lots of um, shorts? I don't think massively, actually. No, I, I don't think we are seeing a great deal of, of uh, short uh, dealings here. It's just people are actually physically selling the stock. So I don't think the shorting is the problem. Now, the silver lining is that we are oversold. So, you know, when were we oversold previously? Let me highlight that for you here. Was, we were oversold here in, in mid-October. And that was the area up here. And that gave us a bit of a bounce up afterwards. And then also in July, uh, and again, that was the bottom of the market here. And then we recovered. So generally speaking, uh, after being heavily oversold, like we are right now down here, you would expect a recovery, but it can take some time. So I, I personally still think that we are in this long-term upwards trajectory of my, my thin green line here which you know should take us back up into the mid 20s but you know then i'm an optimist uh, desmond i haven't seen the billy numbers yet but yeah if they're down 14% they must also have had a pretty uh, um, unhappy numbers this palantir broken through the support at 2212 uh, here it says 2215 let me look at the live ticker PLTR, because that one's a little bit faster. 2215 still. No, no, they're, they're both synced up. So we are, we, are, we, are, we are okay for the moment. We are, we are bobbing around this support line here of 2212. So uh, we'd like that to hold uh, today, and we'd certainly like to finish well above that today. Uh, and Desmond, I agree with you. Very hard for people to hold on to a stock that's just not doing anything. Uh, and unless you are in, you know, um, uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. Even if you're selling puts, I mean, there's, there's no reason to hold the stock because you you basically have that 20% opportunity cost, right? I, I, I totally get that. I totally understand why people don't want to hold that. Um, so... Uh, Desmond, is, is that Billy uh, who's, who's raising convertible notes? That wouldn't be very good. 
Okay, Kern, great to have you on the chat here. It's uh, Let's have a look, a few of you asking about Neo's chart. So uh, what's going on here? Well, again, we are, we are testing, we are testing and retesting lows, right? So our support line here is essentially 38.72. We dipped slightly below it today. And now we are back where we were about five days ago at the low. So that's kind of our, our uh, support line here, 37.72. We'd like to stick to that, um, ideally, at least at the end of the day. At the moment, we seem to be doing that. We are recovering ever so slightly at 39.90, but still down almost 2% here. Uh, okay, a few questions here on, on crypto and Bitcoin and so on. Look, the, the, the challenge with the whole crypto space is that you, here it is, um, you know, Bitcoin falling a little bit at $58,000. Yeah, we could do technical analysis on that, but it'll change every 30 seconds. So it's almost not worth it unless you want to learn TA, in which case it's a great chart. Nothing moves as much. You would think on a day where inflation is, well, we were not worried about oil, you think it'd go up. But today, oil prices are down 5%. So the inflation story here doesn't work. Therefore, it's going down. So I do think crypto does benefit from higher inflation. Um, I, I think people get more, more and more concerned about it not being transitory. Um, the trouble is just, you know, it's a punt. For me, it's a punt. I, I, I have some crypto and I'm happy with it. If it goes to zero, I'm happy. If it goes to, to the moon, I'm also ecstatic. Uh, and I think it needs to be that percentage of your assets where you just don't worry about it that much just because it's very, very hard to predict. It basically runs on largely on um, momentum, right? So. Uh, Chris, you want to pay your car off early or buy put more in money in stocks? I personally, and this is obviously not a popular opinion, but I'm always of the view: get rid of debt first. Uh, I, I just think debt elimination is, is a great thing. Consumer debt is not really great. Uh, if this was a, a mortgage on a house, it'd be a slightly different conversation. Although I'd still lean towards the debt payments, but any kind of consumer debt isn't really a happy place to be in, and there is a fair chance that interest rates could go up. So the cost of that debt could go up and so on. Uh, and yeah, there is an opportunity cost. Say if the market goes up another 10%, then we would have been better off. But it's if 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 you, you can reduce your risk and you can sleep better at night and you can have a, a cleaner uh, start to more investing. So that's, that's what I would do. But of course, you are entirely uh, up to you to make that decision. Amanda just says NVDA because NVDA is flying. Uh, absolutely flying, um, ten and a half percent up, uh, phenomenal, really just phenomenal. And look, it's breaking our Fibonacci 323. That's the resistance, and we're at the moment above that. So we really are shooting off towards Pluto. Uh, Unter, yeah, Neo's earnings have been been decent. Absolutely, I think it's just that. You know, if they're going to deliver 92,000 cars or something this year, they will have done a tremendous job, 120% growth or something like that. The, the concern people have is just what's happening. We don't know. Management isn't willing to give us guidance, really strong guidance on what's happening next year because they don't really know what's happening with supply chain and so on. So that is, I think, the, uh, the, the, the risk and the reason the stock isn't moving very much. It's just because management is, is being cautious and cautious is nice, but uh, confident and, and over delivering is better. And that's what the market's looking for, right? So, New York's at 36.39, Palantir 22.02. Yeah, so uh, Weijo, though, which is the Vozo stock, is up 18.5%, NVIDIA up 11%. GameStop's up 2%, which is never a good sign. I think Amazon up almost 1%. Microsoft, Uber, all in the green. And then we turn Redis is Rivian, 10% down. Baba, 9% down. Lucid, 8% down. Chinese education stocks are falling. And I finally actually sold, closed my short position on Tal. It wasn't really going anywhere, but it made about $700. It was a, it was a small, a little flutter on, 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 on just nonsensical companies that shouldn't be around. I actually listened to an uh, investor presentation of some other Chinese education stocks yesterday by accident. And uh, they were basically telling us we were going to teach people English 
and we're going to teach the world uh, and that's the new business I'm just sort of okay you really are struggling are you so yeah uh, paypal is at 204 down another 0.8 percent uh, not really catching a break somehow paypal saying we're not going to use visa card in the uk because of high fees seem to not be perceived as good news i mean doesn't that just mean that they've got such market dominance they can just kick out the biggest credit card in the world uh, in a very large economy so at the moment yeah we're sitting here at 204 our support is essentially 200 200 201 uh, so you know one percent down 204 we're basically bobbing sideways but uh, i think well, you know what i think on paypal um, by uh, Exxon by accident. Yes, it was really. It was by accident. Uh, I was I was looking for the, uh, the the Neo Deutsche Bank investor presentation, and they were. I was a bit early, so uh, I, I listened to 15 minutes of that drivel, basically trying to flog a dead donkey. Uh, and I like donkeys, but you know, just just a strange one. Uh, hi, is talking about the Neo Dark Pool. Okay, let me pull that up for you here. As far as we can see it, well, I so say this is PayPal. So the, in, on the, according to this metric, invest institutions are buying uh, PayPal uh, by the fistful every day. But yeah, it's low, it's slow according to this, but it's not like a massive signal. It's just sort of a flatness down here. There definitely was a, a big drop when we got, before we got to the peak. So uh, they were selling out and sort of in the 40s uh, and then we got above 40 it was all retail money at least according to this um mike is saying ggpi is back to 13 dollars i mean i think you know with SPACs, you see a fair bit of volatility you see a fair bit of profit taking from people uh, i i like the fundamental story to this uh, and ironically as we're looking at dark pool here we're seeing the first glimpse of what looks like institutional buy-ins. So as it's dropping, people are are, are picking it up. So uh, expect volatility. I, I think that's really was what I would say. But I personally, and this is not advice or recommendation to buy it, uh, I'd be surprised if this doesn't go over 20 bucks. But that's just my, my view on that. Um, Abby, how's dark pool trading legal? Well, it's it's actually it's actually um, it, they're Finra registered. All the dark pools are registered with the Finra, and they they came up with this because they were saying, "Look, uh, I'm Morgan Stanley. I want to sell you know five million shares in in say PayPal, uh, and I put that order out to the market. The size of the order is so big, and the algorithm trade they're the fast high speed traders see it and then they run ahead of my trades they make my trade more expensive they make some margin on that and and it screws up our ability to execute large trades so the uh, finra and sec and the banks and the infinite wisdom came up with the solution of why don't we do our trades off the new york stock exchange and do it in a private room somewhere and not tell anybody and then finra said well you're going to have to tell us so they said, okay, we'll we'll tell you after we've done it. Uh, but what it means essentially is that there is no bid ask spread. There is no market setting the price. It's just, you know, a client, Morgan Stanley literally has a dark pool. So if you're a big client at Morgan Stanley, you can call your Morgan Stanley broker and then they'll you want to sell something, say they call some buyers and they literally haggle for a price on the phone and then they sell the block like that and it doesn't hit the New York Stock Exchange. It does get reported to FINRA, so the data is there somewhere, but it just means, you know, it's it's uh, it's not exactly a level playing field, is it? But yeah, it, it is a very good question, Abby, uh, why this is legal. Uh, but their rationale is that it makes the market more efficient. But then, you know, I guess they're paying the bills or something.
Jay says they should not call it dark pools. They call it back rooms or something. Yeah, I mean, it's all the same thing, isn't it? Um, Abby, yeah, I'm, I'm largely with you on that. I think it's uh, it's essentially a way to keep the, uh, the, the smaller guys out. It, not just retail, actually, but probably also smaller uh, banks and, and so on. So they can create an advantage for their customers by, by having this. Uh, and, and and we are left kind of in the dark. And, you know, we have this indicator here, which I show you on the chart sometimes, but this is not a perfect indicator. This isn't live stream data from all the, the dark pools out there, right? This is just a, a metric uh, based on the publicly available uh, FINRA uh, data on, 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 uh, on, on shorts and so on. So, yeah, it's, it, the world isn't a fair place, but you know, we can still make a great deal of money from the market. So there's still a lot of marvelousness in the financial markets. It's just uh, not exactly written in our favor. If you haven't yet, guys, joined, signed up for the free webinar, which is coming on the screen here and giving you uh, ep epilepsy. <laughs> I hope not. Uh, go to phoenixfriends.org slash webinar and sign up because it won't be on YouTube and you'll see less of me this weekend because I'll be webinaring and I'll be teaching you how to trade options so you can build and generate a reliable, stable income from it. So this is not crazy trading stuff. High risk stuff is exactly the opposite. So if you want to learn something about that exactly, absolutely for free, come and join me, felixfriends.org slash webinar. It'll be great fun as well. Uh, and Uh, Brandon says, should we sell puts on NEO? Well, I actually looked at that earlier today, Brandon. Um, when you sell puts, the one thing that works against you is uh, when volatility rises. Now, the volatility of NEO is low, and that is therefore the risk that the volatility could rise is fairly substantial. Uh, you can type that into the, into, uh, the internet, uh, or you can um, pull up an indicator here like... Uh, Ah, uh, where is it? Implied volatility. Where do we have it? Historic. Historic volatility. Here we go. So you can literally pull up here, down here, historic volatility. What I would then do is pull a line through it here. And then you can see whether you are very high or very low. Go back in time. And you can see that you are, Neo's volatility is lower than it usually is. It's something like 30th percentile or something. So the chance of volatility increasing is quite high, uh, which works against you when you sell puts. So that's just a little bit of something to understand there when you're when you're trading options is, is, is how volatility feeds into that. Uh, Desmond said, your significant other asked if you had a webinar this weekend with, with Felix. I'm very glad your significant other knows who I am. Um, Mike, are we going to record it? I do, of course, record it, but I and I, I will make it available at least to those in different time zones. But it, I would highly recommend you join us live because you can also ask me questions and then that's going to influence uh, how much you get, I get out of that. But if it's you know, three in the morning for you or something, then um, you know, I, I might just make that available for a little while afterwards. Um, righty ho. So futures looking pretty positive, but part of the markets are looking pretty ugly. Uh, Nvidia is looking marvelous. Uh, Weijo up almost twenty percent. But let me turn this upside down. Rivian Lucid. That's just profit taking, isn't it? I mean, they're still worth. 112 billion dollars so it's not like the stock's getting hammered here but people are taking profits which is a sensible thing to do quite frankly barber down 10 percent which seems a bit of an overreaction given that we were kind of expecting what we got there uh, and uh, ggpi is down to 1372 obviously being dragged down a little bit by the the, the top two of the sentiment but down half as much as lucid and rivian which is i guess something one thing that does sort of make sense uh, Chinese education stocks down. DD is down. Palantir down to twenty one eighty nine. Ouch. And Neo down to thirty eight forty two. Again, doesn't make a lot of sense. If you think about that, oil prices are at really high high levels. Who does that benefit? EV cars. Um, maybe another reason why why Biden is is pushing oil prices lower down so much to help his buddies at GM, where I think he was yesterday. So.
<laughs> okay, guys, I appreciate you tuning in. I appreciate um, you subscribing very, very much. Uh, we will have fantastic more content coming out uh, today and tomorrow. And make sure on the weekend you join me for the, the lovely webinar here, felixfriends.org slash webinar to learn how to earn consistent income with options trading. And I look forward to seeing you on the next one. I wish you a marvelous trading day. Uh, don't be too obsessed uh, with, with staring at stock tickets. There must be better things to do. Uh, but I really appreciate you joining in. We'll be live again tomorrow, same time, same place. And have a marvelous day.